Good evening, one and all, and welcome to this Ottawa Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada monthly meeting on the 1st of April 2022. And a uh, particular welcome to other RASC Centre members who might be joining us, or members of the public, or, well, anyone else. Next one, please, Chris. So usual things, yes, we are recording this for posterity. It will be available on our fabulously well-appointed website at ottawa.rasc.ca. If you have questions, please use the Q&A. And uh, Chris and I will be monitoring that and we'll relay them to the speakers. The chat box comments will not be responded to and you cannot raise your hand for fear of having it removed. Next one, please. So program for tonight, my introduction. That'll be followed by uh, Dave Chisholm with his usual monthly wrap for what's coming up in the skies through April. We've got our uh, first and second guest speakers before the break. After the break, Hugo Lama talking about Apollo 16, our observation reports, Oscar and his fiendish monthly observing challenges, and the usual slew of announcements. Next, please. Over the last couple of months, we've noticed a bit of a slip in some of the disciplines associated with these meetings. And so particularly for our new members, I think it's important to emphasize that this is a serious scientific body with a serious mission to expand and promote serious knowledge about astronomy. And therefore, there shall be no singing this month. Last month we had singing. I thought there wouldn't be, but I slipped up and there was. Back in February, we definitely had singing. This month, no singing. Next, Chris. This is April 1st. There will be no April 1st shenanigans because we are a serious scientific body. Third, please, Chris. There will be no mention of the fact that today is my son's 21st birthday at all. The subject will not come up and it will not be addressed even if it does come up. Thank you, Chris. Next one. Welcome to our new members. I hope those rules didn't sound too dictatorial, but you will appreciate the need for keeping a fairly tight rein on this group. So we have four new members for this month. Welcome all. You are all cordially invited to make presentations as soon as you are motivated to. Thank you. This brings us to 23 new members for the year, which is not a bad running total. The question that needs to be answered is why would you spend monies like you see on the screen here to be a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, whether as a regular family or a youth member? Next one, Chris. We have a number of assets available to members. We also have a cat on my table. Uh, under normal circumstances, and perhaps soon now, we'll be able to get back to the Ted Bean Telescope Loan Library, as well as the Physical Book Library, both of which are isolated at CASM at the moment. We have full access to the Fred Lawson Observatory again, the only restriction being in place is the need to wear masks inside the warm room. And of course, as a RASC member, you're able to participate in the various observers certification programs. Next one. There's also a number of print products, uh, Sky News, bi-monthly RASC uh, magazine, the quarterly journal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the annual observers handbook, and our own monthly Ottawa newsletter astronauts. These are all the benefits that come your way with membership. As I like to emphasize, I think the greatest benefit in membership is the category of other, uh, people that you can come to cross paths with, deal with, and gain expertise and experience from. That includes our members as well as the invited speakers that we bring into uh, these monthly meetings. On that point, I think I would like to just hand on over to Dave at this stage. 
Okay, folks, let's take a look at what's happening in the Ottawa skies for April of 2022. Um, so next slide, Chris. Okay, so here are the uh, phases of the moon. And uh, we've got a new moon uh, tonight. And uh, that's where we're having our meeting when it's a perfect night to do observing, but frankly, it's cloudy anyways. Uh, in terms of the moon phases, uh, the uh, full moon is on April the 16th. This full moon was known by the early Native American tribes as the pink moon because it marked the appearance of the moss pink or wild ground flocks from the first spring flowers. It's also been known as the sprouting grass moon, the groin moon, and the egg moon. It's also called the fish moon because it was the time when the shad swam upstream to spawn. This moon is also known as the paschal moon as it is the first full moon after the spring equinox. Easter Sunday is defined as the first Sunday after the Paschal Moon, unless the full moon falls on a Sunday, in which case Easter Sunday is a week later. So because April 16th is the uh, full moon, uh, Easter Sunday is on the 17th, Sunday right after it. Next slide. Okay, we have the uh, Laird's meteor showers. Uh, it's an average shower producing about 20 meters per hour at its peak. It's produced by the dust particles left behind by Comet C-1861 G1 Thatcher. Uh, it runs annually from April 16th to the 25th, peaks on the night of the 23rd, uh, 22nd and 23rd. Um, it won't be too bad this year. The waning gibbous moon may block some of the fainter meteors, but there's still a potential for good show. Best viewing time will be from a dark location after midnight. Uh, meteors will radiate from the constellation Lyra, but can appear anywhere in the sky. So I'm going to mention the, the Eta Akrods meteor shower, May 6th and 7th, because it occurs before our next meeting. Uh, this is an above average shower producing 60 meteors per hour at its peak. Most of the activity is seen in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, the rate can be about 30 meteors per hour. Peaks uh, May 6th overnight to the 7th and that it appears to radiate from the constellation Aquarius. As you can see, the days are getting longer. Here's our sunrise and sunset for the 1st and 30th of April. Mercury, uh, we have the greatest, greatest eastern elongation on April 29th. So Mercury is uh, far enough away from the sun that we can view it uh, just after sunset on that day. And in fact, either side of this, uh, you'll be able to see that as well. Here are the rise and set suns for rise and set times for Mercury as well. Venus is visible just before sunrise, and as we move through the month, it moves back through the through the evening. Um, Mars is visible before sunrise as well. Jupiter visible before sunrise the second half of the month. Right now, sort of rising and setting with the sun. Saturn's visible before sunrise as well. Uranus is visible in the early evening and uh, Neptune visible before sunrise in the second half of the month. Right now it's rising and setting with the sun. And here is our cartoon of the month. But, uh, Mick would enjoy that one. Uh, great to ask about that, Dave. I don't think it's at all appropriate. Uh, this is a <laughs> serious scientific body, so thank uh, you. Of, of course, of course, yes. <laughs> so that's it for this month. We'll see you next month, folks. Um, before we proceed, Chris, I got a message from Steve saying that my microphone seemed to be not optimal. How is it now? It's it's not bad, Mike. Sorry, just, I it... was muted. I'm. Yeah, there's a bit of an echo in the background. It's not bad. All right. I'm sorry. Just bear with me. I'll. Uh... I will. Just adjust the setting. How about now? Better. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Stephen, for pointing that out. All righty. So to our first invited guest speaker for tonight, it's Dr. Nicholas Castle, who will be addressing us on uh, Mars rover science. Uh, as you can see in the bio there, he's a self-confessed rock collector and space nut for as long as he can remember. He's currently an active member of the Mars Science Laboratory on the Curiosity Rover Operations Team, where he helps to coordinate activities for CHEMIN, the Chemistry and Mineralogical X-ray Diffraction Instrument. Outside of mission operations, his research focuses on meteorites, especially those from Mars. 
He is a bit of an instrumentation junkie, works with electron microscopes, mass spectrometers, X-ray diffraction, diffractometers, high temperature furnaces, and the occasional laser. And lucky guy, he now gets to do this on Mars. Childhood dream come true, I guess. Nick, so over to you, please. It's a bit of a childhood dream. So uh, I've been asked here today to talk a little bit about what it's like to do mission operations. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, um, well, look into what that looks like. So before I can really talk too much about mission operations, I need to give you a little bit of background on what we're doing to motivate the why we're doing what we're doing. So I'm gonna start this off by giving you a very quick, you know, one AU view, overview of what's the geology of Gale Crater? Why did we go here? I'm gonna talk a little bit about who am I and how did I get to be doing what I'm doing? Um, uh, quick preview into that, I'm nothing too terribly special, uh, just someone who spent way too long in education. And then I'll get to the meat of the presentation, which is giving you a little bit of a picture of what it looks like to actually run operations. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't actually show you screenshots of the actual scripting program and you know, the sorts of tools we actually use. Something about that being ITAR restricted and the mission operations team saying no. But, you know, I'll do what I can to show you as much as I possibly can. So quick overview of Mars. Here's a map of the topography of Mars. Uh, this is actually getting to be a pretty venerable map at this point, but it highlights several of the important things that we knew before we sent the mission, uh, that is the Curiosity rover to Mars. One of the things that should be the first thing you notice is that the upper portion of this is blue and the lower portion of this is red. Well, this is a topography map. So that tells you the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere are at very different elevations. That is the Northern hemisphere is at a much lower elevation and the Southern hemisphere is at a much higher one. You can also see the Northern hemisphere is relatively smooth. There are craters on it, but not nearly so many as there are throughout the Southern hemisphere. That tells you the Southern hemisphere is a lot older. And there's a boundary between these two uh, which is what we call the hemispheric di uh, discontinuity. It's uh, where you switch from highlands to lowlands. Now, there's also some evidence uh, for stream channels. One of the most famous is the Spallus Marineris here uh, with the uh, multiple stream channels that flow into the Northern Basin. And so there's some idea that during Mars's early history, this would have been an ocean basin or at least a substantial body of water that everything was draining into. And the question is kind of, well, what's the nature of that basin? So that's one of the reasons why we sent Curiosity to where we sent it. it. Turns out to be a crater that's right along the boundary between these two. So if I zoom in towards our field area, which is located in this portion of Mars, in this image, there's actually four active row, or sorry, four active missions on Mars right now. We've got Mars 2020, which many of you will know as the Perseverance rover. It's in Jezero Crater in the western edge of this image. We've got a Chinese lander and its associated rover, whose name I will not try to pronounce because I will definitely botch it, even though it looks simple, I'm sure it will be wrong. There's also the InSight lander, which is the only lander, the rest of these are all rovers. And that's doing geophysical measurements of the interior of Mars. Uh, geologically speaking, it's actually a pretty boring location, which was intentionally chosen to minimize the likelihood they'd land on a rock or have some sort of situation where they couldn't deploy their geophysical instruments. And finally, uh, towards the lower right, we've got Mars Science Laboratory, which is the Curiosity Rover in Gale Crater. And you can see that's located right along this boundary. We're going from the Southern Highlands to the Northern Lowlands. Zooming in on that, this is Gale Crater. Now, a few things to notice about this one. First is, this is a relatively old crater. And you can tell that because the rim is weathered. You don't see a clear ejective blanket. And for that matter, you don't really see a central uplift peak. There might be one there, but there's this large mound of well, dirt that's in the middle, that has nothing to do with the cratering process itself. So the question becomes, how did it get to be that way? Our landing site was in the Northwest portion of this crater, uh, actually in one of the relatively deep areas, which gave us a chance to perhaps see some of what was already down in the basin because we're excavating to that sort of depth. If you look at a real light uh, image of this crater, this is a, a mosaic taken from orbiters that shows the landing ellipse. We actually managed to land just a little bit to the east of the center of that ellipse. And this is the central uh, mountain, what we call Mount Sharp or formerly Aeolus Mons. And there are a few interesting features to see. One is this dark material that surrounds that mountain. These are actually dune fields. 
Uh, and because of the rover, we've managed to sample that. And we know that these are basalt sands. So this is uh, some of the average composition of the old surface of Mars that's blowing around as dust and uh, sand particles. And that features into the story of how this crater formed. So let's talk about that a little more directly. If we go back in time a little over 3.8 billion years ago, you get to the early history of Mars where there was no Gale Crater. Well, that's also a warm, wet period in Mars' history where there's significant amounts of water. Well, uh, Gale Crater formed, this would have been an impact event, would have created a central uplift peak, a nice sharp crater rim, ejected blanket, all the usual things you'd expect to see. But being in the warm, wet period of Mars, this now also became a basin. So it did what basins do, and partially filled with water became a lake. Well, lakes over time slowly fill with sediments, so that's exactly what happened in Gale Crater. But as long periods of time passed, the chemistry of the minerals being eroded into that basin became a little more mature, the water composition of the waters changed a little bit, and we started to get different sedimentary layers forming in there, including apparently one that had a relatively high iron composition. And as time went by, the waters presumably became a little more acidic, the weathering progressed a little bit more, we started to get some clay-rich layers in there as well. Then we got to a point where Mars's climatic shift happened, and this is where Mars started to really dry out. We switched from this being a normal, what we call lacustrine basin, where you've got sediments flowing in uh, on a river forming in the lake bottom, and turned into an evaporitic basin. This is where the lake is drying out, and you're forming um, salts, in this case sulfates, uh, that are making a large layer at the very top of this. Now, eventually, Mars itself completely dried out, and that's when Gale Crater would have stopped depositing sediments, at least in this mode that I've been talking about so far. But if we'd stopped here, and that was the sum of the history, we still wouldn't have Mount Sharp in the center. We'd actually just have a filled basin. How full is still an active matter of debate, but we know it would have gotten to at least the height uh, of the currently existing Aeolus Mons. So what happened next is the winds blew. And these start to slowly erode the layers around the mountain um, based on prevailing uh, north to south wind direction that left this as a yardang, that is a wind erosion feature in the center of the crater. Different layers have different susceptibilities to the uh, uh, wind erosion, so we get interesting topography related to that. And there were also periods where dry flow uh, let materials into the crater, or for that matter, aeolian, that is wind-based deposits formed in the crater as well. So there's an active sedimentation and erosion process going on, uh, particularly early in Mars's history. So this is the environment we're set in. If I start to cartoon this diagram, you can get a few features that is what I base this cartoon on. Although I should note, this is not meant to be taken at all rigorously because it's a cartoon, not a topographic profile of the actual crater. But I mentioned at one point, we'd have a layer that had a little more iron rich. Well, one of the models we have for the formation of a feature that motivated us going here called the Vera Rubin Ridge is that this is sediments that were deposited with a high iron signature. On the earth, we see these sorts of things in the bottom of ocean basins that lasted for a very long period of time, banded iron formations. So there's a question of, is that what we're seeing here? Up section, that is up the mountain from that, we actually see a section that had a very high clay signature. So clays form over long periods of time uh, where there's mineral chemical reactions with the water and indicate a very long standing lake environment for it. So this is also interesting in terms of, could this have sustained life? Because if you had a very long-term wet environment on the earth, everywhere we see water, we see life. If we had life on Mars, this would be a great place to go to look for it. And then finally, we see this major climatic shift where we uh, got into evaporated basins as Mars itself dried out. And we've got that boundary preserved in Gale Crater, so we can actually trace along the geology of that drying history in Mars. And so that's exactly what our traverse is designed to do. We actually landed on the flats where it was easier to pick a landing spot, drove for almost five years before we got to the field area we just, that I just described as we're traversing up Mount Sharp and seeing these transitions in Mars's history. So what's that look like? We zoom in a little bit. Here's our actual traverse and landing point. To date, we're actually just over 17 miles into the drive. That's about 23 kilometers since I'm talking in Canada um, uh, from where we landed. Now we landed on the flats and it turns out there's some very interesting geology, but I wasn't part of the mission team until we actually got to right about here, which is where we started to transition to that ridge, uh, the Vera Ribbon Ridge. So let's zoom on, in on that and see this uh, geology I was talking about. 
Here's the traverse for about the last four years, coming up on five now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the Vera Ribbon Ridge is that high iron signature we saw uh, that we we're uh, asking how could this have formed? And then uh, going up the mountain a little bit further in the stratigraphic low on the mountainside is this clay rich unit, uh, what we now call Glen Torrigan. As we moved off, uh, skirting around a giant sand patch here we couldn't traverse through, we made it over to a boundary here where we could start to trace up uh, into sulfate, uh, sulfate units, things that at least spectrally from orbit showed a sulfate signature. And most recently, we've actually transitioned onto this feature here that we call the green hue pediment. Now, this is part of that extra complicated geology that happened in the end, where there is some erosion uh, and deposition and lithification that happened after the simple story of lake sedimentation that I described to you. So there's more complex geology than just this simple cartoon. If you're curious what this looks like, here's a view from the ground from actually relatively uh, soon after we landed, looking towards our current field area. You can actually see that field area in here where I can sketch out some of the same features. Uh, this is that green hue pediment uh, and this ridge, which is actually a little bit hard to see is the Vera Rubin Ridge and just beyond that is the Glen Torridon. My current location is right about here uh, up on the hillside. So, I wasn't brought here to talk about the geology of Mars, but I've succeeded in doing so for the last little while. So let's transition to get to the heart of this talk and what does it look like to do mission operations? Well, to have some context for that, uh, I should tell you a little bit about who I am. I am not actually someone particularly extraordinary. I am someone who went to school for entirely too long and I got interested in astro materials along the way. I started off as a normal geologist, but something about, how I kept asking questions like, well, how does the stream erosion change if you have less gravity, a more uh, dry environment, you know, possibly different chemistry of the surface materials? And my professors kept saying, quit asking about Mars. So that's how I got interested in the subject. After graduation, the way I made it onto the rover team is I applied for a postdoc to work with that. Um, by the way, my training was actually in meteorites. Uh, so looking at the same kind of geologic process we look at on the Earth, but applying it to other worlds. Uh, specifically asteroids, like shown in this picture here. The postdoc I worked at was with the Lunar and Planetary Institute, which is uh, a um, research institute closely associated with the Johnson Space Center. This is one of the places you go if you want to look at astro materials. That's meteorites that you study on the surface of the Earth, as well as return samples. After finishing my postdoc, I went on to a soft money uh, research institute called the Planetary Science Institute which specializes in allowing scientists to do remote work and facilitates grants wherever you happen to be working. And there are actually a number of Canadians uh, that work with PSI, as well as people from a number of other countries around the world. It's physically located uh, primarily in Arizona, which also happens to be where I am, but uh, you can work for PSI from anywhere. The instrument that I work with is called the Chemistry and uh, Mineralogy uh, X-ray Diffractometer, or CHEMIN for short. What's an X-ray diffractometer? I'm so glad you asked. Basically what it is, is it's something that uses Bragg diffraction to figure out what minerals are making up the sample you're looking at. The critical distinction I'm trying to make here is between minerals and elemental chemistry. Elemental chemistry tells you the ingredients of the thing, but the mineralogy tells you what the thing itself is. It's kind of like the difference between knowing the thing you're about to eat contains flour or knowing if it's a pie or a cake. So we're getting that extra context that tells us, you know, pie or cake as we're going through. The way it works, we generate x-rays uh, using uh, a x-ray source. Basically, it's a fancy light bulb. Instead of argon atmosphere, you uh, use a tungsten filament to uh, accelerate electrons into a vacuum. Uh, you accelerate them and hit them into a target piece of metal that generates x-rays. To make them into a beam, we stop all the x-rays that aren't going the direction we want them to go. This is what a pinhole collimator does. We shine this light into a sample that we actually have uh, convecting due to vibration. So that has a guaranteed random orientation of all the minerals. And what happens is if you hit light at a repeating structure, and if it's the right wavelength of light for the scale of the repeating structure, it will diffract. That is, it will bend off to a different angle, or at least some of the light will. If you're looking at atomic structures, that is things in minerals, uh, you need x-ray lights because that's just the wavelength that it works. This is governed by something called Bragg diffraction. Now on Earth, we would load these in sealed sample cells, uh, which we would then put in our X-ray. In this particular case, we can't do that because we're not there to load it. So instead we have ones with an open top and we take the simple mechanism of 
when they're upright, we load them. When we're done with them, we turn them upside down and hope to dump them out so we can reuse the cell. It's worked most of the time-ish. We've got quite a few, so we're actually doing pretty well on resources. At the end of it, we have a detector that uh, picks up all these diffracted lights and uh, they come off as curves. Looks something an awful lot like this. This is actually one of our raw, raw data sets from Mars, a sample called Mary Annie, uh, which we analyzed a couple of months ago. Each of these bands is telling us about a specific spacing within a mineral structure. So we actually care about where that angle is between the principal beam and the band, so we can reduce this into a 1D pattern. Looks something like this, where each of those peaks represents one of those circular bands uh, in the previous 2D picture. And if you're clever and know your mineral structure as well, you can sort out how each of these diffraction peaks relates to minerals and work out exactly what minerals are there. You can even work out the relative ratio of how much of each mineral you have, and to a certain extent, the chemistry of those minerals you're looking at. So this gives the geologist a lot of the tools they need to really interpret what's going on on the ground surface. This is one of two internal instruments inside of the Mars Science Laboratory. Uh, our sister instrument is called Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM. Uh, it's a uh, combination of a GCMS, uh, that's a um, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer uh, with a capability of heating samples and thermal uh, decay uh, uh, process. So you can look at when minerals break down uh, based off of heating. But this is just one pair of instruments uh, within the whole suite of what MSL does. Because we're an internal instrument, we actually don't track every single spot along the way with what I do and just my instrument. We actually have to stop, spend a long time to drill or scoop a sample, and then place that uh, into our instrument so we can analyze it, which means my uh, view of the mission looks a little more like this, where each white spot is a place that we've paused and drilled, characterized the area very well, and then ingested those powders into our instrument to finally get results that uh, was within my team's purview of doing. Which means I could actually show this as a picture of what the mission looks like from the perspective of Kemen. These are 32 of the drill holes. We actually have 34 now. I did go find the last two pictures, sorry. Um, but this is what it looks like. The thing is though, is we have a lot of other instruments within the suite. We've got the robotic arm, which itself contains three tools. Um, the drill bit itself, as well as APXS, which is a compositional tool, uh, and Molly, uh, Molly, which is the Mars Hanlon imager and gives us very high resolution pictures of the surface. There's also the remote sensing mass that contains ChemCam, which uh, has that famous LIBS, the laser that uh, breaks down rocks and its composition, as well as, um, uh, excuse me, uh, MassCam, which uh, allows stereographic imaging among other things. So if you've ever seen a 3D image of, on the surface of Mars, that's probably the instrument to, that took it. There's also a bunch of weather equipment to look at the radiation environments, wind pressure, wind speed, uh, relative humidity, all of these sorts of things as well as a neutron instrument for looking at hydration of the surface, as well as a whole bunch of engineering instruments that we need to help plan our drives, monitor the wear on wheels, uh, and look through the health of all the other systems. So how do we coordinate all of these different things all at once? Well, we do that by following an operations timeline. Each day we uh, go through what we call tactical mission planning. Tactical means we're literally looking at just this one day. It might be relative to doing one, two, three, uh, or even four or five um, souls worth of work on Mars. It's a solar day uh, in our usual way of referring to it. But it's just the planning we're doing that day is tactical. And as you would imagine, it starts with a downlink. That is, we've received information from Mars and ends with an uplink, which is, and now we've told the rover what to do. And mission planning is everything that happens in between. In this cartoon that I put together, the red are the kinds of activities that I would be doing offline and other roles would have similar sorts of things they would be doing offline. And blue are the major meetings where we all come together to talk through, okay, where are we? How do we put the pieces together? How do we make it work? To break this down succinctly, it starts with data evaluation. The data comes down from the rover and the first thing that each of us does for each of our instruments or engineering tasks, uh, whichever we're assigned to, we look through the health of our system. How are we doing uh, for the uh, engineer that looks at data? How are we doing on data volume? Engineer that looks at power, do we have enough power in the batteries to do what we think we wanna do during the day? 
the instrument health? Did we do all the activities we planned to do in the last plan? Have any errors come up? Have we drifted outside of operational temperature? Because many of the systems have a temperature range they're comfortable operating in that's not the same as the weather conditions on Mars. Go figure. At the same time as we're doing that, we've also got a meeting for each of the science theme groups or STGs, where they're looking at, okay, what science objectives do we want to do? And we put together the pieces of what that team, that theme group wants to see done during that day. This is in, con in conjunction with engineers. They're doing a similar thing to assess rover health, arm activities, or even moving the rover. And each of these come together as fragment, fragments that we then bring together. And that's the next major part of the day is bringing all of those individual pieces together into one unified plan, modeling that plan to see, did we break it? For example, if our power drops below 0%, that plan's not viable. Um, if we exceed our data volume, that is if we haven't removed enough data from the rover to keep up with uh, the new analyses we're taking, that also doesn't work very well because we'll just overwrite data, we won't get anything new. So the whole rest of the day is putting that plan together, writing the individual scripts that will do the activities, modeling that as a unified thing, as well as in uh, the individual pieces, making sure it all works and compiling the final computer code we're gonna send to Mars, which is the very end of the day. This is where we do a final check to make sure everything turned out the way we anticipated it would, nothing got broken during bundling and packaging together, and then submit it to the Deep Space Network who will transmit it to Mars. So that's tactical mission planning. Now, one of the tricks is the only way we can do tactical mission planning on this, you know, on a actually relatively short time scale, that is about six to eight hours in any given day, is because we already had a pretty good idea of what we wanted to do which is where we bring in the concept of super tactical mission planning. This is not dealing with today's plan, but tomorrow, the next day, and the day after that, what we call N plus one, two, and three. So after that first meeting where we finally agree on, okay, this is what we're gonna try to do today, a group of us step aside from the mission planning cycle to say, okay, what are we gonna do tomorrow? And it starts with, well, what do we think we want to do based off of what we've seen? And one of the coolest parts of this is then we have a science discussion. This is where anyone from the team who wants to present on any subject uh, related to what the mission is doing can present to the team. And anyone can listen to these talks, voice their opinion. And this is where we also make major decisions about where the rover should be going next. Ultimately, that results in a group trying to lay out a skeleton that is a fragment for you know, what we want to do in this particular group. Geo and mineralogy makes one. Uh, environment makes one, the engineers tend to make theirs as well. Uh, and at the end, we have uh, skeletons, basic versions of what we're going to start with on the next day when we're actually laying out the flesh of those uh, before we stick it together and make our plan. Now, if you let a bunch of scientists and engineers do this at only looking at what we're doing today or the next couple of days, you end up with a problem where you never really move anywhere because there's always more to see. Anywhere you are, there's more analyses you want to do. So there has to be a role whose job it is to keep us going, keep a pacing. This is what we call strategic mission planning. These are the people that look 30 days out or 60 or 90 days and say, what's going on with this? One of the uh, critical roles for that is called a long-term planner. Yes, on Mars, 30 days is long-term. This is a meeting that meets every single planning cycle uh, where the people who have this role get together and talk about what we've seen, what we want to see, how we're doing with the objectives and uh, what we're trying to get to in that area and what that should look like going forward. You know, How are we going to check off the boxes on all the things we said we want to assess while we're there? And is that list still the set of things we want it to be? There are other uh, strategic planning groups, for example, ones that lead a campaign. That Hematite Rich Ridge had a campaign called the Vera Ruben Ridge campaign, whose entire goal was to suss out what we needed to see while we were there to make sense of you know, the geology of that place. What did it tell us about the history of Mars? That uh, group came and went uh, as we were on the root ridge and ultimately pushed off and yielded to the next campaign. There's also a group that deals with the stratigraphy, just trying to put together the strat column, ones that look at comparing orbital data to what we're seeing on the rover. All these different groups uh, form together to just come alongside and say, how can we improve what we see on this mission? So that's kind of what mission planning looks like. The next question that comes up though is frequently, who's actually doing this? Because a lot of people before they stop and really think about it, 
trying to have that image from Big Bang Theory, where it's Howard Wolowitz and three of his friends sitting in a room with a joystick. Not how it works, trust me. Among other things, at its furthest point, it's a 42 minute time delay to send a signal to Mars and hear back. Just doesn't work with a joystick. So who actually does it? Well, the answer is it's a little bit complicated. It's a mixture of scientists, engineers, managers, and administrators. And what's worse, many of us wear multiple hats. There are engineers that have backgrounds in science, scientists that are doing engineering work. There are managers from both groups that are there just to help people work together and flow, administrators that are making sure that the budget, IT, all of the rest of that works. And none of it works if we don't have all of that working together. But we all have one goal, which is to maximize how much science we get out of this project. So every day we're trying to download the data, digest it, figure out what it means, figure out how the rover's health is, and build that plan to figure out what we're gonna do next and how to best use these limited resources we've been given. What does that actually look like in terms of people? Well, the hard statistics I have are based off of the first 90 souls, that is 90 Martian days of operations. During this time, we actually had all the scientists come to JPL. There's about 280 scientists or members of the science team working together during that time. And they're working on Martian time. For reference, the Martian day is 24 hours, 43 minutes long, which means your clock on Mars and your clock on Earth only make sense with each other about once every 37 days. That's a pretty brutal shift to have to work because what time you get up and what time you go to sleep slowly drifts through the day with each day that you're working. On any given shift, there are about 100 scientists working just to make mission operations happen and about 150 that were working to interpret the science and figure out what does it all mean? And therefore, what should we look at next? Since then, we've transitioned to operating on a more humane schedule, working on Earth time. But this comes up with complications of its own because Mars time is still drifting relative to Earth. And we like to have things like weekends. Well, the rover doesn't get weekends. We don't just shut it down during the weekend and do nothing and charge the batteries, although sometimes we have days where we charge batteries. And this is what we call restricted versus nominal. Nominal is one day on Earth for one day on Mars. Restricted is, let's do a few more days on Mars. There's also that schedule coordination thing where every 37 days the clocks line up, that was only 36 days on Mars. So about every once a month, we have what we call a soliday, which is a day on Earth that doesn't have a corresponding day on Mars. What's that look like? Well, here's a group picture of the team in a uh, tail end of 20, uh, 2016. Turns out twice a year, we try to get together at one of the centers, every other one being at the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is where operations is centered, uh, to talk science in person over a week. This is one of the most beneficial strategic planning sessions that we have as a team because we're all physically there. And it's amazing how much you can get done when you're talking to people face to face versus much of the rest of the year, we're wherever we are. Some of us are in France, a few people are in Hawaii, we've got Canadians, we've got Americans distributed across all the states. Well, not all the states, but many of the states and many of the provinces, um, as well as a number of other countries. So it's hard to do all of this synchronously. Anyway, uh, I hope that was a sufficient window into ops and that I didn't go too, too long on this. Are there questions? Yes, indeed. First of all, thanks, Nick. It, uh, I found it so refreshing to get a, a, a personal take on how big science actually works at the human level. And we've had previous presentations about the instruments and the rover itself and so on, but you've given us a really clear picture of the dedication and commitment that uh, everyone on these teams is making. Now, to the questions, we have three. Uh, first is from Tegan Warkenton, who asks, as someone who is doing graduate studies in astrobiology, do you know of any careers in this field as Mars seems a good candidate for finding ancient life biosignatures? Yeah, there are actually a bunch of people that do astrobiology um, and work with the rovers. Um, the original um, instrument lead for Kemen is a guy by the name of Dave Blake, and he works out of NASA Ames, which is in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, there's a lot of astrobiology work that's done in Ames, um, and the current uh, instrument lead is Tom Bristow, who's also there uh, and works very closely with Dave Blake. Um, 
not to name a whole bunch of names, but there are a bunch of other people that do astrobiology and do it specifically related to the rovers. In fact, right. the last participating scientist call for perseverance highlighted that they really wanted more astrobiology expertise uh, for participating scientists to expand what they could do with the tools available on that rover. So there are definitely careers in it. That said, it's not easy either. Uh, a lot of these things are the kind of things where you've got 300 people competing for four or five slots. So um, yeah, there are opportunities, uh, but you're gonna have to fight for them. Thanks, I, I think that's a definite yes for Tegan. Second question, has any radioactive rocks, uranium, thorium, for example, been found on Mars? It depends upon what you mean by radioactive. Um, most people that ask this question are asking about you know, the kinds of things that you'd build a power plant out of. We haven't found anything along those lines. There's no big chunk of enriched uranium that we found on Mars other than the chunk of plutonium we brought with us. Anyway, um, most rocks, however, are radioactive. Um, most things in nature are radioactive. So there is a little bit of radiation coming off of everything. Uh, and we've actually done some work with that uh, to exploit that to do science on Mars. Um, if you're curious about that, uh, I would look into some of the radiogenic dating that was done with SAM uh, and what goes on with an instrument called DAN, uh, which is a neutron uh, observatory that's on the rover. Very good. Next one is from C. Douglas O'Brien, who asks, you've shown that Mars has strata. NASA has indicated in 2003 that Mars has a liquid core. Therefore, is well, are there plate tectonics at work and strata deformation? Are all your strata flat, so to speak, underformed? So our strata are as close to flat as we can re uh, reasonably estimate. They are tipping a little bit, but no more than you might expect from original deposition. And one of the questions we've been looking at is, well, uh, are there, um, is the bedding tilted at an uh, angle that would indicate there is anything more than just deposition uh, and um, lithification that happened to these sediments? And so far, we haven't seen any indication there's anything more. To date, we have no real evidence for plate tectonics on Mars. Um, and not quite sure why you're referencing the core being liquid or solid, because that actually isn't what drives plate tectonics. Um, on the Earth, we have a significant debate between um, a hotspot push or a slab pull for what's going on. But either way, the mantle is still circulating on, uh, on the Earth and on Mars just very slowly. And it doesn't seem to have broken the surface to create plate tectonics. Good day. And then we have two questions from Gordon Dewis, and this will close us out. And again, thanks very much for your uh, presentation. Could you talk more about how you actually program the actions? And then secondly, yeah. what is involved in preparing for a Mars solar conjunction? Ah, well, that's a fun question. Uh, I'm gonna answer the second one first. Solar conjunction for those who don't, um, don't know, is when the sun is between the Earth and Mars. We obviously can't transmit a signal through the sun. In fact, the sun puts out so much um, radio interference that's difficult to transmit close to the sun. So there's a chunk of time uh, every couple of years where the Earth and Mars are aligned in such a way that we really just can't talk to the rover. In fact, leading up to that, where the signal is getting increasingly worse, we restrict activities so that you know, small errors in the code we send don't end up with catastrophic consequences. For example, you really don't want the arm uh, movement numbers having a number added to them uh, so that you try to push the arm into the surface instead of touching the surface. Um, so for example, we restrict arm activities when we're getting close to conjunction. Anyway, the short version is we start restricting activities as we get close to conjunction uh, and do fairly simple things that don't need a lot of human intervention uh, to make sense of the results. Uh, so it's a good time for long-term experiments and recharging batteries uh, and just basically letting the rover sit for a little while. Um, this isn't to say it's wasted time. It's just to say it's not very active time. So we're not moving around. We're not taking lib spots. We're not uh, analyzing things with Kemen. Uh, we're doing much more passive activities during that time. Now, in terms of how we actually build the scripts, we use a program called mSlice. 
which I'm definitely not allowed to show you screenshots of. Partially because this will be publicly available, it is ITAR restricted, so I can't export it from the US. Um, but basically it looks like a scripting language. Um, you've got an interface that if you've programmed in C++ will be fairly familiar, uh, or for that matter, Python or uh, MATLAB. This is coupled with a timeline program that keeps track of what blocks of time we expect everything to happen in. You see the computer on MSL doesn't work quite the same way as your desktop. You don't tell it, I wanna do these 40 things, tell me when you're done. You tell it, I want you to do this one thing, you have this long to do it in and then cut that off. Now, here's the next thing that you need to do and then cut that off and so on and so forth. And this is the way that spacecraft are built uh, routinely because this operating system is a lot more stable. It doesn't get hung as often because an activity will cut off when the system clock tells it to. I'm sure there's a much more technical explanation but you'll have to talk to a software engineer for that. But the way it works is we script out the code. Um, we do an estimate for how long it'll take. We put all those estimates together to make a plan. We model our code against that plan to see uh, what it thinks of in terms of uh, CPU uh, utilization. Does that slow down our activities? All that kind of work. This also lets us model data for how many products we'll generate and power for how much of that we'll use uh, to maintain the battery above a certain state of charge. Um, all of this kind of stuff just works together. Did that kind of answer the question? I believe it was quite thorough, thanks. And so My pleasure. at this point, Nick, Again, I'm going to say thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Glad we had you. Hope to see you back at some future stage when there's uh, newer results. And on behalf of every on, everybody online here, cheers and uh, wish well, you well. Thank you all very much. Okay. Now for our second speaker, we have Randall Rosenfeld, who is the RASC archaeologist responsible for the primary repositories of RASC's historical materials in material, in material form, known as the RASC archives. He curates a rare book collection within the archives concentrating on the history of astronomy in Canada and in RASC itself. He's a frequent contributor to the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and in 2021 uh, presented a two-part series exploring the history of astronomy and colonialism in Canada. And it's on that basis that I invited Randall to address us today. Over to Randall, please. Thanks, Mick. And I'll just share my screen. Ah, I see. I just had a message. I cannot share, start sh screen share while the other participant is sharing. Hmm. Let's try again. Oh, there we go. So can you all can you all see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Colonialism and astronomy in Canada. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can, but you could move it into full screen mode. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And there we go. So colonialism and astronomy in Canada. And I could try to read the um, other stuff, but I won't. So what I'm looking at is an abbreviated version of those two studies that Nick mentioned. I'll just to give you some flavor of what the contours of this looks like and what the problems are, because this is a, it's a hotly contested subject um, and with good reason. So first, a necessary caution. And I, sh I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Never stopped me in the past. The views expressed here are those of the presenter, me, and they are not necessarily those of the RASC. And to help you visualize this, here's the graphic. Got Urania on the RASC symbol there, and you got that wonderful picture of me on the right. And it's not the echidna, Nick. They're not the same thing. So just keep that in mind. Tiny Norman. If, if, exactly. If you want to blame anyone for what's said, you blame me. So next definition, what are we gonna call this? How are we gonna define this? We've got two pretty good definitions here. They're close to not the same. So colonialism, it's a noun. It's a practice of domination, which involves a subjugation of one people to another. It usually entails a transfer of a population to a new territory where the arrivals, that's the settlers, 
live as permanent, well, live as permanent settlers while maintaining political and cultural allegiance to the country of origin. Imperialism, although the noun, it's a type of rule in which a foreign government administers a territory without significant settlement instead of resorting to indirect forms of domination through trade, diplomacy, military, or cultural ascendancy and other not so nice things like that. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the, just the term colonialism for the most part, and I'm gonna mean both things. Because I, I understand why they, these distinctions are made, but they don't always apply. It's basically when you've got one culture dominating another. And that the domination is, doesn't ref reflect the free will of the group which is being dominated. And right in the middle of there, we've got a picture of Clive of India. So why have I mentioned him? Well, as you can see from the little panel below, he was actually the brother-in-law of the astronomer royal, never, ne never masculine. And it just sort of shows you some of the connections between astronomy, professional astronomy at the highest level in the colonial period, and the people who brought about the rise of empire, at least, at least the British empire. But I've also got to say this, virtually every culture has found itself in the roles of oppressor and victim at one time or another. If you think the culture to which you belong has never dominated another, you just haven't looked hard enough into the past of your group. The other thing I should add is that whatever a particular society did in the past is no justification for a present a, a dominant society of now, it's no justification for them to be oppressing anybody and, per, and to be oppressing one of those groups that may or may not have oppressed you in the past. They can't use that as a justification for keeping people down. So where do we start? Let's start here. It's a copper, a copper engraving for about 1600 of Amerigo Vespucci. There he is discovering the Southern Cross while he's exploring. And you see how useless his, uh, his crewmates, his, uh, his shipmates are, they're all falling asleep. So this engraving, the reason I like this, is that it neatly illustrates a connection between astronomy and early modern European voyages of discovery. Because what you got on the table, what he's holding up, what he has in both hands, are actually astronomical instruments used for navigating. And here they're identified. So you got a straight edge, our military sphere, and so on. I won't spend any time on these but just this sort of visually makes this connection. What about Canada? What happened here? So what happened here is the same as what happened elsewhere. No big surprises there. So Champlain's ast astrolabe. It's virtually, I mean, this is really a mythic object for Canada. It's like an icon of early European exploration here. I mean, you can, you can go to, um, well, what's now given the misnomer Museum of History. Uh, I like what it was called before, but, and, and you can see this on display. That's not the one in Ottawa, by the way. That's the one in the Rask's Dorner Telescope Museum, but it's a very close copy of the Champlain instrument. And there's a quote at the bottom from the works of Samuel de Champlain, uh, translated into English. And what he's saying there, is that navigation is one of the most spectacular, amazing arts you can practice. You can go places, you can go far with this. Um, and even though, you know, even though you do so at the risk of life and limb, you can still achieve a hell of a lot, provided you've got courage and resolution. And then comes the colonial bit. Through this art, he means navigation. And when he says navigation, he really means astronomically aided methods of finding out where you are on the earth. So through this art, we gain knowledge of different countries, regions, and it goes on. You find out about their riches and you, you can indulge in trade and you can combat their ideologies, their religions by um, propagating Christianity. So this, these very words of Samuel de Champlain, one of the prime explorers, early explorers for Canada, makes this connection between astronomy and colonialism. I'm not really a surprise. 
one text, one book was absolutely fundamental in underpinning Europe's culture of conquest. And that's been since the Carolingian period in the eighth century. And that's the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. Christians read themselves into the text as the successors of the chosen people and dealt with all the claims of that toxic exceptionalism. And here's some examples of this. And uh, that um, painting of Moses there, holding the tablets. And I've got there some of these texts which are used. The one on the right um, is from the early 70th century uh, King James translation. Um, it's, it's one of these passages talking about how you should treat people who are not of your cultural group. And it's not pretty. Oh, by the way, and these texts still operate today. They still lie at the root of a lot of European law, which is current. And a lot of countries seem to adopt a uh, Old Testament attitude to those outside the group. Here's another one. I'm sure some of you have heard of this, Doctrine of Discovery. Here's one example of it. This is from the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI. This is from the document given to Ferdinand and whatever her name was, uh, and, and Isabella to do with Columbus's discoveries. And here's an excerpt. Our beloved son, Christopher Columbus, at length with divine aid discovered certain very remote islands and even mainlands that hitherto had not been discovered by others, wherein dwell very many people living in peace. We give, grant, and assign to you and your heirs and successors, kings of Castile and Leon forever, together with all the dominions, cities, camps, places, and villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances, all islands and mainlands found, and to be found, discovered, and to be discovered. What does this mean? That if something, if a land, a territory, is unknown to Europeans, and there's no European Christian group which has claimed these, then you immediately have, as a discoverer, so-called discoverer of these lands, You've got rights over them. They're yours. There were now, this was refined and changed over time. I should say, in defense of some people, there were a lot of religious uh, priests and monks in this period who didn't like this at all. They thought this was this was a bad thing to do. It was immoral. There were uh, theologians who thought the same thing. There were uh, lawyers who thought the same thing, but they didn't win because greed came out on top when it came to European expansion. But just remember, there was opposition inside Europe. Most professional astronomy done in Canada during the colonial period was, a, was practical astronomy. So it wasn't really pure research. It's the astronomy of time and place. The astronomy which gathers basic data for, to make accurate maps. This is astronomy in the guise of a technique to make empire happen. So it's a servant of empire. This doesn't mean the people doing this, these practical astronomers were evil. A lot of them did competent applied science. A lot of them enjoyed really good relations with First Nations they worked among and First Nations they worked with. It was like, you know, real cooperation. You can see this in some of the records of the Hudson's Bay Company in the late Georgian period. So to stand back for a minute and think, it's really hard to go against the grain of a, of a society if you're working within that system or even to see what's wrong with it. And if you're going to object against, against the society with your part, that's gonna come at a real cost to you and your family. You could end up uh, being the equivalent of blackballed, you could end up with no job, out of work or worse. So the question to ask yourself is, if you were one of those practical astronomers 200 years ago, 400 years ago, would you do any better than any of the people working then? But the main thing we have to recognize at the same time is that the end result of this work led to something which wasn't good. And that is the spread of colonialism. And we're still dealing, we're still dealing with the sequelae of that. It's a story which is not over. And here's an example. Red River Rebellion, 1869-1870, is the story of what happened to Louis Riel and the Métis. I think the Métis are in news uh, this week visiting Pope Francis. So, an astronomically aided surveying. So, astronomically aided surveying, it enjoyed the dubious distinction of adding to the immediate tensions which ignited the Red River Rebellion 
So this is during the process of the transfer of Rupert's land by the Hudson's Bay Company through a deed of surrender to the Canadian government. Rupert's, uh, Hudson's Bay Company, owned a, they were incredibly wealthy in land. They owned a huge amount of North America. And then, so it came to the point where they transferred this to Canada. Surveys were sent out. And so a survey ventured very quickly on the Métis lands. And the Métis were not a direct part of the transfer of the Rupert's land to the Hudson's Bay Company, even though this is the land they were living on and had been living on. They were not pleased by this. And they were really not pleased to see people practicing foreign survey techniques, so astronomical techniques, on their land. And this was one of the things which contributed immediately. It's like a, you know, one of the, it's like lighting a match in an open, uh, you know, you know tinister of petrol. And this really read, you know, one of the things which led to the Red River Rebellion. So here we have astronomy serving a colonial land leading to real and dramatic political consequences. Again, consequences which have not been resolved to this day. And there's a picture from about 1870 of some surveying party in Red River. And just sort of in the middle there, you can see one of the astronomical surveying uh, pieces of equipment. And that's the sort of comment that someone might have said at the time. Canada's original national facility for doing astronomical research, our equivalent of the world's observatory, Greenwich, and our equivalent of the Observatoire de Paris in Paris, of course, was a Dominion Observatory in Ottawa. There's a picture, early picture of it on the left, and thank God the buildings are still extant now. Though I know that there's issues about preserving them. The founders of the Dominion Observatory were professional surveyors. They were trained to do practical astronomy, and that's astronomy in the service of colonialism. And these guys are really good at it. Um, Dr. W.F. King, Otto Klotz, but King was the important one. They were really, these guys were field tested. And doing astronomy in the field in the 19th century, it was no picnic. You had to be tough, you had to be resourceful, you're living off the land. You had to protect your really delicate equipment. And it was the same for people doing the same thing in Australia, I should point out. It's greatly to the credit of the people who founded the Dominion Observatory that they had the imagination to embrace the idea that the institution they were building, the facility they were constructing, would be able to branch out into doing, into doing pure astronomical research. They built that into the plan. But while that was going on, why J.S. Plaskett was putting Canada astrophysically on the map at the Dominion Observatory with the 15-inch refractor, while that was going on, the Dominion Observatory was still doing old-style astronomy at place and time. In other words, serving the colonial machine. Um, they had a program, even one example of this, they had a program where they would rate chronometers, they would test and approve uh, surveying equipment for people doing these surveys to divide up Canada. The Dominion Observatory spawned the highly productive Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, 1918, and the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, 1960. Both of these are world-class important institutions, which are still going, unlike the Dominion Observatory. Well, they're the, they're the heirs of that tradition. Now, here's the thing. The colonial heritage of these of our current astronomical, national astronomical facilities, it's plain to see that the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory and the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory grew from this historical, from this colonial matrix. And the implications of this haven't been fully worked out. Um, and it's something we'll have to come to terms with. And it's not just a Canadian problem. And I'll end the formal part of the presentation here. Am I doing okay for time? Yeah, um, it's probably a good time to switch to questions if there are any. Don't see any on the board at the moment, uh, but as someone who comes from a country that owes its European quote unquote discovery uh, to a voyage of astronomical discovery by Cook to Venus for the 1769 transit, I resonate very much with a lot with uh, much of what Randall has said. Uh, 
are there any questions from from the audience? Well, it appears not, Randall. So I put everyone I, to sleep. Oh, that can't accomplish <laughs> something. Start the revolution, man. Uh, Anyways, it's cloudy out, so no telescope is going to hurt in this process. Um, I will say one thing. I will say one thing, and that is, I'm sort of torn. So I've, I've got the thing that has to be utmost is a damage. Well, the damage that was done to um, Australian, the First Nations in places like Canada and Australia, and the fact that there's no way around it. The modern countries have been built on a land grab. And we just have to come to terms, to terms with that. At the same time, I'm full of admiration for the sort of, um, I'm full of admiration for the type of astronomy, however practical and mundane it was, that these people did in the field. It was amazing. And I love the old equipment they used. And I, I love much of the culture of the period, even though it's got this really dark side about it. I suppose personally, I'm gonna to have to come to terms with that as well. Um, give you one more example. So what, when I wrote the first of those papers, I think I said somewhere, it might've been, been buried in a footnote, it's only a matter of time for the Canadian equivalent of Thomas Jefferson is found. So if you, if you recall Jefferson, he's, what was he, second uh, president of the US, well, one of the early ones, real enlightenment figure. He's really interested in science. He, also, he, he has his own research quality telescopes. He's really concerned to get things like the, um, the publications of the Paris Observatory. When he gets a hold of Messier's list, published list in the 1780s, he's really excited. He tells other people about it. But the same Thomas Jefferson kept slaves. So balancing the stuff out. Anyways, within a week of finding that, I found a Canadian example. It was the guy named J.F.W. Debar, trained in Switzerland, uh, fantastic, a brilliant cartographer, and the guy who had one of the earliest research observatories in Canada. And while it's not Canada, Canada, it's in Nova Scotia, we've got a list of the instruments he had. He had amazing equipment there. I mean, just unbelievable stuff of the period. Turns out he had, he had uh, a couple of slaves, those are the ones I was able to trace. But what's, here's the interesting thing. So you think, yeah, that's not good at all. But here's the interesting thing. One of the slaves, um, Cato Smith, dies after Debar. And Debar lived to be over 100. And Debar's family puts an obituary in the local newspaper about Cato Smith, saying how much everyone really liked him. And that they made a particular point of pointing out that Cato Smith was on the astronomical expeditions that Debar, Debar run. So you think about this for a minute wait a minute, and, and, and you wish there was more information, but you think, wait a minute, what this is, so if this happened now, Cato Smith would be included, he'd be called, at the very least, a technician on the Astronomical Exposition. He'd probably get his name on the published paper. So here we have um, a Black Canadian from the 1780s, who was probably the first person we know of who may have taken part in professional level astronomy. I just wish there was more information. Anyways, I'll shut up now. And I'll just intervene. It's Chris here. Well, uh, Randall, there may not have been any questions posed. There are certainly comments in the chat box. And uh, one in particular from someone you will, you will know well, uh, Rob, Rob Dick, about certainly not asleep, but your talk encourages us to reflect on how things happen for good and, and ill. And others thanking you for your presentation and colonialism and how interesting it was and what an incredible story. So definitely appreciate it. Oh, great. I really appreciate that. Speaking of Rob, uh, some of you may know Rob stepped down from the Light Pollution Abatement Committee. Rob is really almost single handedly, though I shouldn't put it that way, sculpted our approach to light pollution. Anyways, in the latest, in the April journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which you can all get for free, um, there's an article there in Rob's article honor. I'll just point that out. Okay. Thanks again, Randall. Really good presentation. Again, hope to see you back in, a, in another lifetime. That's right. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay. And now I'd like to hand over to Jim Thompson for his announcement on this year's Astronomical Day, International Astronomical Day. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thanks, Mick. So, 
International Astronomy Day is just over one month away. This year it is scheduled for Saturday, May 7th to coincide with the first quarter moon. For the past two years, there has not been any sort of in-person public star party in Ottawa for Astronomy Day due to the pandemic. Instead, members from RASC, the OAOG and, and OFS worked together to put on a virtual event. Those two virtual events were successful. However, there is a strong desire from both club members and the public to get back to an in-person event. Next slide, please. So at the moment, Rask Ottawa Center is not planning anything for Astronomy Day. Normally Rask would partner with the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum to put on some sort of live viewing activity. But at the moment, there is nobody available to coordinate such an event. The OAOG has been successful arranging with their previous partners, Rio Can and Chapters Indigo, for it to host their 20th Astronomy Day event in the parking lot next to Chapters Silver City. If you are interested in volunteering to help with that event, please drop me an email at top hyphen jimmy at rogers.com. The OFs have traditionally had their own sidewalk astronomy event at the chapters in Canada, but at the moment it has not been determined if that will happen this year. Contact your fellow OF members to find out what the plan is. The success of Astronomy Day depends on volunteers. If you are interested in sharing your passion for astronomy with others, please think about joining us. Thank you. All righty, thanks, Jim. And I hope you get overwhelmed with responses there. Uh, we're up to the break now. Five minute bio break and the question to ponder, what is the only fish to be found in the Rask Ottawa fabulously well-appointed website? And there you go, five minutes. See you back at the end of that, thanks. Hey, Chris, are we good to proceed? We're good. And I'm just commented before you had your headsets on, you're getting many uh, possible answers to your question in the chat room. Yeah, and even one correct one. Okay, so can you flick to the, the next slide, please? So, Jim Thompson provided this image of IC 1795 of the Fish Head Nebula. That was my answer to the question. However, in the question of full fairness, uh, I can't see the correct response. Hold on. Uh, John Falbo, I believe it is. Uh, he came in with that as the correct answer. So he gets the brownie points. However, I've been picked up on a technical issue by Dave Anderson who has also pointed out Andrea's photo of the shark nebula from a few months ago. So I obviously should have specified what is the only bony, aka non-cartilaginous fish on the website. But there we go, I'll learn. Next one, please, Chris. Well, how about Richard Taylor's koi fish galaxy? <laughs> I don't believe we have a photo of it. I, I will stand corrected if presented with the I'll check it out for myself how's that okay so we pass on to Hugo now 1972 April 50 years ago the launch of Apollo 16 the, the 10th manned mission 
of the US Lunar Landing Program. Hugo, not only a member of long standing in Rask, Ottawa, but he was there at the time. And so I was presenting his personal mission. And my sound is doing something really weird. So over to Hugo, please. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I will share hopefully. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, uh, do you have my screen now? Oh, very good. <clears throat> Okay, I will be giving you a short uh, talk on uh, my trip to Apollo 16 launch back in 1972. And uh, there's our uh, Apollo 16 emblem, if you like, with uh, the astronauts Young, yeah. Mattingly, and Duke. And what's the reason for this talk at this time? Well, it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 16 launch. And it just happened that I got a converter for converting Super 8 movie film to digital. And that's about just about the last uh, opportunity to do so because it's now getting on to 50 years and the film does uh, deteriorate. Uh, it's got, well, it's low, low res, it's got dust, it's got splices and uh, also, there's very short clips because the reels at the time were only three and a half minutes long. So you use the film rather sparingly. Okay, so why should I show it now? We can get uh, high definition, high definition uh, footage of the rockets and various other things. Well, this is the actual footage back from 1972. So why did I go on this trip? Well. Again, it's a, shall we say, a, a confluence of two different things. First of all, it was the last daytime launch of uh, the big Saturn rocket. So opportunity and a classmate of mine uh, needed to attend a conference in Dayton, Ohio. So uh, there was my co-pilot, if you like. And at the time I was also, in between jobs, so I had the time to do so. And of course, the Ottawa winter uh, was severe with snow that year. So there we go. So just to give you an idea, here's Ottawa. Cape Canaveral is way down here. And you will notice that Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers took off, is approximately halfway. So why not? see where it all started. Now, Kitty Hawk is on Cape Hatteras, which is really a very long sand bank. And the actual place where the, uh, <clears throat> where the Wright brothers took off is at a place called Kill Devil Hills, just a few kilometers south of Kitty Hawk. Okay, the Wright brothers first powered flights. Okay, where? Kill Devil Hills, as I said, 17th December, December 1903. They had a canard type biplane that they built. It had only a 12 horsepower motor, which is not much more powerful than your lawnmower. They used twin props and it's steered by moving the hips to twist wings and move the rudder simultaneously. Perhaps Elvis would make a good pilot on that plane. Orville and Wilbur Wright took turns. So they were very fair about it. They made four flights from 12 seconds to 59 seconds, reaching the farthest one reached 260 meters. Here we have an actual photo. They used a track made out of two by fours and a dolly from which they launched the plane into the wind. And they made up to 852 feet on their longest flight. So why, why uh, <clears throat> mention the Wright brothers? Well, it was the start of flight and 
if you look at what they did, there is, you can compare it to what NASA is doing and was doing. They made extensive tests and calculations before the, the construction and flight. They calculated for power and stresses. They tested their foils in a homemade wind tunnel, which had not done, which had not been done before. Most of the people trying to fly, they just, uh, if you like, put their plane together and uh, trusted to luck and off they, off they went without much testing, off uh, without trying. They also <clears throat> paid attention to balancing their components and their placements and they had the engine offset and the pilot offset, they were side by side. And of course, weight reduction, big factor in both cases, both at NASA and for the Wright brothers. Further, they adapted existing technology. They were familiar in building bicycles so they could use bicycle chains and other components. They did custom fabrication and they contracted out for parts. Well, you know all about contracting out for parts of NASA. Well, the motor needed to be custom built because they couldn't find a motor powerful enough that was uh, light enough. So they had it custom built. Safety precautions are a big deal. In case of the rockets, as you know, they can blow up. But in case of the Wright brothers, they're close to the ground, underpowered and at mercy of gusts. There are credibility disputes on patents and world belief where they're really the first to take off in motorized flight. With NASA, did they really walk on the moon or was it a big Hollywood production? So, and here's a view of a copy of the Wright Brothers plane, which you uh, seldom see, because you can see one of the brothers beside the engine. They're side by each, and you can see the asymmetry to the one propeller and off to the other propeller. Now, what most of you don't know, because there's, the engine is much heavier than one of the Wright brothers, the right wing was actually four inches longer. So they, they paid attention to detail. Okay, so we go on to the next sandbank. Again, the Cape Kennedy or Cape Canaveral, it's on a big sandbank and it's uh, just off or opposite Orlando on the coast of Fl Florida. Looking at the actual site, the John Kennedy Space Center, there's all kinds of launching facilities and rockets in this whole area. The actual uh, Saturn V rocket took off from pad 39A over here and the vehicle assembly building where it was vertically assembled is right here in the middle. And the viewing was from Titusville along the shores of Titusville or from this area. Now, since ours was an impromptu trip, uh, we didn't have any reservations. So we had to watch from Titusville across the bay here. Now this vehicle assembly building is huge. See how monstrous it is? There is a water tower and there's little cars to see just how huge It was three times or is three times the volume of the Empire State Building. Imagine that. And that's four giant doors, 456 feet high. And to get rid of fog that can roll inside the building, Florida being quite a, a damp place. The air conditioner has 120 million BTU per hour capacity. Your little air conditioner in a house is just an ant by comparison. Now being such a large building, it has been damaged in hurricanes several times. Several of the panels have been blown off at considerable expense, but of course it's been repaired. When we got there, it was just the day before. So the Saturn V rocket was already rolled out to the launch pad 39A. 
and just how big is Saturn V rocket? Well, it's bigger than the Statue of Liberty, taller than a Big Ben clock tower. By comparison, the Wright brothers' plane would stretch across the face of the clock, and that's it. Now, the actual rocket, Saturn V, all this is mainly fuel. And it has three stages. The third, first, the, the first stage is the most massive, is up to here. The second stage is up to there. Both of them have five engines. And the third stage has only one engine, is much smaller. The, now, the part that goes to the moon is just this part here. And the, the lunar excursion module is just this little piece in here is tucked in inside. OK, and a crew for Apollo 16, as I mentioned before, it was John Young, Charles Duke, and Ken Mattingly, who piloted a command and service module. So he didn't actually land, but he orbited around the moon. So to, among all the training that they have, they also visited Canada, Sudbury. So that's another connection to Canada. Um, now, they went there to study the breccia and the shadow cones from a giant impact 1.85 billion years ago that formed a, a depression in Sudbury. Now, contrary to popular belief, they didn't go there because Sudbury looks like the moon, no. It's only a certain areas where the rock is exposed and that's where they went and studied the geology with uh, uh, ge geologists and scientists. So they got training for about three days right on site here. And so let's go, let's go see the launch. Now, the um, Super 8 movie film was, of course, uh, silent. On the original, we did, uh, I did add some sound, but for our, this uh, shortened version for you, I, I will just speak over it. That's 1972 was a heavy winter in Ottawa, as you can see. So we had visions of going south in a sunny Florida. Here we are in our little, little automobile and uh, we're off. So it's just to give you the contrast between this sort of depressing, dark and gloomy and the visions of sunny Florida coming up. We're here, it's getting greener already. We are in uh, going through the Smoky Mountains and here at Kitty Hawk is just south of Washington there here is Cape Hatteras. As you can see, it's all great big sandbank, lots of beach, lots of wind. And imagine this is middle of April. So it's pretty cold water and the air is pretty cold. But my buddy, Len, he'd never seen the ocean. So he insisted on going in. I don't know how cold the water was, but by the time he came out, his back was purple. This is typical Cape Hatteras housing. As you can see, it's all on sand. And then after there, we can go straight to Florida and go to another sand bank. Now there, we got the Royal Tour of the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And unfortunately, as you can see, it moves very quickly through there because we were basically captives on a tour bus. So you couldn't really stop and uh, dwell and take leisurely pictures. Now there's the actual Saturn V for the Apollo 16 launch. And that's as close as I could get at that time, but that's the real McCoy. Here we have tanks of liquid hydrogen and we had the, uh, the press and various other tourists there 
wanting to see the facilities. But as I said, since we we're there only a day, okay, and there's the ramp leading up to the launch site. <clears throat> and here's that gigantic, huge building. And there's one of the tractors that would bring the rocket over to the launch site. It moves extremely slowly, inches per hour, because of the enormous weight. Now, as I mentioned, from Titusville is where we watched. And along this, OK, here we have it. We're in Titusville at the Chamber of Commerce site on the beach there. This is where I brought, brought, bought my Apollo 16 sticker. And of course, you need facilities because the number of people there <clears throat> were quite quite large, and uh, and there's my friend with a suitable sunshade. Uh, people had gathered here uh, days earlier to get a good spot, and so they ha settled down for all kinds of activities, to getting some suntan, to people watching. And as you can tell by the um, assortment of cars and where they're parked, there, there was nothing really organized, but it was a party atmosphere, like a great big, uh, how would we say, music festival or what have you. Now you may ask, uh, why am I showing so much of this uh, uh, area here where people are waiting on uh, different types? Uh, and there's uh, in the water, there were all kinds of crabs and horseshoe crabs in particular that the kids were fishing out and looking at. Water was quite clear at that point. I don't know how clear the waters are these days, but uh, back in 72, they were quite clear. Anyway, as I, and all kinds of activities happening. Uh, why am I showing so much of this uh, happening here and people gathering? The reason is to give you some feel of the weight, people were there days ahead. And even when we got there, just just waiting for a few hours for the rocket to blast off. Um, this will give you some feeling of the weight. Now there's one of those big uh, uh, horseshoe crabs <clears throat> and a little one. And as you can see, the number of people, the density of people kept increasing as, as the hours got closer to the uh, blast off time and every perch was taken. Now from this site, um, you couldn't feel the earth tremble as it took off. I gather from the other side, you would have, here we go. Here we go, blast off here, road along the track. Uh, <clears throat> flight one, flight two, flight three, and flight four. That was our Orville back for the first flight. And there we go, blast off. This is real time. And unfortunately, I only had a six time zoom on my uh, uh, film camera. Now, just imagine that <clears throat> Big Ben clock tower blasting off, lifting off from the ground. If you can imagine, imagine the am am amazing amount of power that's coming out of that rocket, out of those engines for that rocket. And uh, you can see it's accelerating. It seems slow, but in reality, it, it started to move quite fast because of the size and we're far away. And of course, you don't see the rocket very well because of the brightness of the exhaust. Pretty soon you'll see uh, stage two ignite. There we go.
and we're off to the moon. So <clears throat> it took them the actual trip to the moon. It took them five days. When they got there, there was a five hour delay in landing due to a problem with the service module known as a Casper. They landed in the Descartes Highlands in hope of finding volcanic rocks. And they returned a day early due to service module engine problems. So where did they land? They landed here in the Descartes Highlands, Hall 16. I call this the, the Pleiades of the moon, eh? six stars on the moon here. Anyway, it was the only one that was in the highlands. The others are lower down. So here they, they got some different results. And here we are. We're on the moon, that's John Young. And one of the first things they did, apart from planting the flag, they put on, <clears throat> they erected a UV camera, which is behind him here, with which they shot towards uh, Earth and, and, and the stars. And where did they go? They made three excursions with the rover. Excursion one, where the flag was, and then excursion two and excursion three. In total, they drove 27 kilometers with the rover and it spent a 20 hour, a three, ex, three excursions in a total of 20 hours total on the moon. And they brought back almost hundred kilograms of rocks, one of which was as much as 25 pounds. So that was a huge rock. They planted a first telescope on a moon to take UV photos. Before leaving, one of them had to go outside the service module to retrieve film from the camera. Back then there were no DSLRs. And they launched a sub-satellite which went around the moon, but it only lasted 34 days due to low orbit. <clears throat> but they left behind instruments which lasted uh, as, as long as seven years. Okay, what were the results? Well, what they found was breccia similar as in Sudbury. So there was no evidence of uh, volcanic rock near the surface at all. And it revolutionized our understanding of lunar geology. However, even so, the Descartes Highlands are geochemically somewhat different from other sites, so that was also valuable information. Uh, in summary, the moon is made of rocky material that has been melted, erupted through volcanoes, and crushed by meteoritic impacts. Now, the Wright brothers, I didn't realize, have left a, really a legacy to the Apollo space program. In 1969, portions of fabric and wood from the Wright Flyer were taken to the moon on Apollo 11. In 1986, other wood and fabric with a note by Orville were taken aboard space shuttle Challenger, which unfortunately blew up after takeoff. However, miraculously, these items were recovered later. In 2021, a small piece of the Wright Flyer's wing fabric is attached to a cable under the solar panel of the helicopter ingenuity that flew in the Martian atmosphere. There it is. There's the first piece of the right plane that went up <clears throat> to the moon and back. And here, this is the piece of wood and fabric that was recovered from a Challenger debris and, and a note by, by Orville. Well, where did that come from? Well, those look like moon rocks, don't they? Because they look like the moon, right? And uh, yeah, but I do. That's it, folks. Thank you. You go for a um, another great personal insight. We've had three very personal pre presentations tonight. And, uh, I, I thank you in particular for picking Apollo 16 and John Young, because he is my ideal of an astronaut's astronaut. 
the only guy to ever fly three entirely different types of space vehicles to pilot them. So thanks for that. Uh, and a thank you from Brian McCulloch and a few others online here. So Chris, can we now go to the observation reports and will you walk them through, please? Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Well, you can see the, uh, the lineup we have here. Oscar, Jim, Richard, Bob, and Paul. Hopefully you've taken notes to uh, where you are in the, uh, on the, the plan. So we'll move first to our uh, observation challenge expert, Mr. Oscar Echeverry. Uh, I don't know that I'd call myself an expert, but, um, but I'll go. This is uh, an image of uh, Messier 101 that I took uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, this was using uh, an eight inch Edge HD uh, telescope uh, with the ASI ZWO, sorry, ZWO ASI 533 MC Pro camera. Uh, it's about three or four hours of data, I think. Um, uh, it was uh, five minutes of exposures uh, stacked and processed in uh, PixInsight. Uh, next one, I guess. Uh, so this is uh, Messier 100. Uh, I took this. I took the data for this. I think last year. Um, it was only about four hours of data uh, using a Canon 60 DA through an 11 inch uh, Celestron Edge HD. Um, uh, yeah, again. So it's uh, three hours of data, um, five minutes of exposures, uh, stacked in Pix Insight and processed there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's galaxy season uh, that we're getting into here. So I uh, expect to see a lot of galaxies and observation reports, I think. That's it for me. Great, thank you, Oscar. We'll move next to uh, Jim Thompson. Uh... All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, so this first image is my attempt to construct a narrow band image of the area around M42 and the Running Man nebulas. The Running Man being an, observer, an observing challenge from last month. I thought presenting the image in this way with each color channel separated out would be interesting as it more clearly shows what physical substance is making up the different parts of the final image. The red channel, in the upper left, is from hydrogen gas emissions. The green channel is from oxygen, it's in the upper right. And the blue in the lower left is from starlight reflected off of dust. Each channel was collected with a different filter using my 98 millimeter refractor and ASI 533 color camera on January 1st this year. Each image is a stack of 15 20 second sub exposures, so five minutes total for each. Uh, next image, please. This next shot uses the same image data but combines it in a different way, making the dust red hydrogen blue and oxygen green. I find that with this color palette, the shape of the running man on the left side there is more visible. A little psychedelic, but uh, helps to visualize maybe a little bit better. Next image, please. Another observing challenge from last month was the trapezium star cluster located in the middle of M42. This image was captured almost exactly four years ago from my backyard in central Ottawa. It was made using my 10 inch Richie Kretchen scope and ASI 294 color camera. At the time I was playing with blue filters to see what they could do for me in my light polluted backyard. This particular filter being 10 nanometers wide and centered on 455 nanometers. So well into the blue part of the spectrum. I found the filter did a pretty good job of highlighting young hot stars in the area of the trapezium. By the way, the trapezium consists of five stars, not four stars. My image is on the verge of resolving the star labeled E in the inset image in the lower right. Uh, next image, please. 
This image is of the Lunar Observing Challenge from last month. I'm doing a little catch up here this month. Um, it is of the Altai Scarp. That's the long uh, cliff face running along the, uh, the lower left-hand side of each of these frames. The image is a composite showing the scarp on four successive evenings, captured pretty much one year ago from my backyard. The images were captured using the same 10 inch Richie Kretchen at F8, a monochrome ASI 183 camera and astronomic Pro Planet 642 IR pass filter. The sharpness of the details visible varies significantly from one night to the next due to the seeing conditions, with the conditions on the 21st being very clearly the best. Uh, next image, please. This is of one of the observing challenges for this month, Messier 105. That's the large spherical shaped galaxy in the middle. It is an elliptical galaxy located about 37 million light years away in the constellation Leo. It has a companion lenticular galaxy, NGC 3384, in the lower right. The irregular galaxy in the upper right is not associated with this group. It is actually located three times further away in the background. This image is a stack of 30 20 second frames captured using my 10 inch Ritchie at F6 with a Mon uh, Mellencam DS432 monochrome camera and Optolong Night Sky H Alpha infrared high pass filter. Next image, please. My final image tonight is the Lunar Observing Challenge for this month. It is the crater Janssen, which is located in the southeast part of the moon. That is the lower right from our perspective. The two images were captured at opposite lunar phases, and they give you a better idea of what the 201 kilometer wide crater looks like. This is an ancient crater being covered in craters of various sizes and ejected debris that almost completely hides the crater. There is a small smooth area in the southern end of the, of the crater suggesting that there was some flooding with basalt lava in the distant past. There is also a prominent rift valley running from the lower left edge of the crater to the upper right, being truncated by the younger crater Fabricius. Fabricius being itself quite an interesting crater as well. Both of these images were captured using my 10 inch Richie Kretchen scope at F8 and a monochrome ASI 183, along with that same astronomic ProPlanet 642 IR high pass filter I like so much. They are both stacks of the best 200 frames out of 3000, stacked in Auto Stacker 3 and sharpened using RegStack 6. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jim. It's a good chance for me to thank you for everything you're doing to put together Astronomy Day. I regret that I won't be able to be there myself. Yep. Great, great to see it back in person. <laughs> and we'll move on now to our center treasurer, Richard Taylor. Oh, well, uh, it seems like there may be two craters called Janssen <clears throat> on the moon. Um, I was under the impression that uh, the one we were looking for was in. Uh, the upper Mare Tranquilitatis. So that's the one that I've uh, highlighted on this picture here. <clears throat> this again, I, like Jim, uh, I had to go back a year and pull out some pictures that I took in uh, March 19th, 2021. And I reprocessed uh, a set of JPEGs that I took through my eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. So this is the best uh, stack of the best 60 out of about 300 that I took that night. I had to use a lot of um, processing to bring out the, the crater itself. It, it's Jan, Janssen here is uh, that one to the right of the label. It's almost submerged in the lava flows of Mare Tranquilitatis. So it just shows up as a, a small ripple in the surface. It was very difficult to uh, 
get it, get it highlighted, then you know, I think you really have to make sure that you're uh, at a good uh, lighting position as well to get this crater. <clears throat> Next one, please. Now this is a new one to me. This is uh, the beginner challenge object for this month, um, M67 in Cancer. Of course, everybody goes looking for the uh, beehive cluster in Cancer, but this one is just a little bit farther south, more in line with uh, Regulus. So I aimed at Regulus and then uh, shifted over in RA all the way to get this one. It's sometimes called the golden eye cluster because of that one very bright golden star in the uh, upper left corner. Next one, please. And this is my take on M105. Um, mine, I guess, is not mirror reversed like Jim's. So M105 is on the right. And then there are the companion galaxy on the upper left and then the little um, irregular one to the lower left. Makes a nice little cluster though. So these ones were taken this year. Um, I had a fairly good night at FLO in mid-March. Next one, please. But my real hope was to follow up on uh, the presentation from Paul Kleininger last, last uh, month about Orion and uh, the last chance to see it before it sets. So uh, I was set up on the North Mound at FLO and I could see Orion very clearly. And uh, after I'd taken the first couple of galaxy pictures, I shifted over and tried to get some more images of the Flame and Horsehead Nebula. And then I noticed something was going wrong. I was getting all these dark streaks across my picture. Couldn't figure out what it was at first. And then I shot my bright headlight <clears throat> in the direction the telescope was pointing and oh, oh. <laughs> Orion had actually disappeared into the trees and I could still see the stars through because of course there's no leaves on the trees, which are bare branches, but the telescope was picking it all up. So that kind of spoiled that night. Next one, please. The next night was a bit better. <laughs> I, we had two clear nights in a row on the, what was it, March 20th, 20th and 21st, I think it was, something like that. And uh, the second night wasn't quite as clear. Uh, there was a bit of high cloud. So uh, Alnitak, the very bright star, in Orion's belt had a kind of blue glow around it. But I did manage to get some more pictures of the horse head and flame. And I combined them with some pictures that I'd taken the previous year. And uh, this is my best shot for it so far. So it'll have to be another winter before we get back to uh, Orion again. It's really down in the West now. And that's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Richard. And there's some interesting comments in the chat uh, about how the, the difference between the two craters in the spelling. One's actually Janssen with one S and the other is Janssen with two S's. And the one with two S's is in Different the Southeast. People, but I didn't look up the history of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thanks to, uh, to Tim and Brian for uh, their little comments in the chat room. Move now to uh, Bob Olson, who I'm assuming has returned from the land of the alligators and he's back in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, the last photo I took, uh, astronomical photo I took in uh, Florida before I came home. Um, it's uh, a pretty shot of uh, the lake behind our house and, and, the, and the sliver of a moon. But the reason I really took it was that if you look at the moon, it's lying 17 degrees further flatter than what we're familiar with uh, because we're there 17 degrees further south. Yeah, um, it's eerie looking at it when I when you're there. Next photo, please. Um, this is a challenge object, and it's a five-hour exposure. And uh, you know, like, where's the challenge object? You look in here, kind of a little pretty galaxy at the bottom, but nothing very spectacular anywhere else. Okay, next picture, please. Yeah, that's the challenge object right there in the middle. Uh, the other one is. Uh, 
a different NGC. Uh, this is a, um, a, a five-hour Im five image in loom only, luminosity only. So it really is, it's pretty deep. And uh, there's a ton of galaxies in this picture. Uh, if, if you, next image, please. And if you look at this, if it's gray, it's probably a galaxy. And there's, there's, there's 20 obvious galaxies shown in here. Okay, next image. Uh, this image was suggested to me by Mike Wirths, who is the uh, donator of that fabulous 18 inch scope out at F FLO. Um, and uh, the reason he told me about it was there's a twin quasars in this picture and a mag 20, a magnitude 20 quasar also. And so, you know, like, where are they? So next image. Okay, this is the lens, gravitationally lensed uh, quasar showing right there. And the mag 20, 21 uh, quasar is actually off the picture. I missed it. Uh, uh, Mike wasn't clear enough in where I was supposed to point to get it. So I just took more data, another, another four hours. Okay, uh, next image. And then I combined them in, uh, in one image. And so uh, next slide, please. And these are the labels of it. There's a 17.5 a in, the, in the left and a, the twin uh, quasars gravitationally lensed uh, are there. And the quasar that Mike was particularly interested in is that the one that's uh, mag 20.08, I guess. Or, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, the interesting thing about it is it's 11.3 billion light years away. You got to remember that the, the, uni the universe that we can see is only like 13 billion light years away. So this is a significant distance across the galaxy. And um, uh, they are just pinpoints, but they are really there. Uh, they show up clearly. The uh, twin gravitationally lensed uh, quasars are, is actually one quasar. It's those two little dots, uh, two little, little um, uh, spots on the screen there, and it's it's only one quasar. We know it's only one quasar because we when we when we do uh, uh, spectrometry of the star of the quasars, they're identical, and so it's uh, there's some intervening galaxy between us or that's bulging them out and coming back together to show us too. The Seifert galaxy um, is uh, has a monstrous black hole in the middle of it, and and that black hole. Not totally sure, but they think that it's an accretion disk that's just lighting up as it gets sucked into the into the uh, black hole. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Bob. And last we have Paul Soniger. Uh -oh. Are you there, Paul? Uh -huh. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I thought it was un unmuted. Yeah, I just I've turned off the video so I don't get choppy on you. Okay, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we, we certainly had uh, some challenges finding clear moonless skies in March, but as uh, as you've heard, there are a few, and so some of the challenges Oscar uh, challenge objects Oscar proposed last month were accessible if you, if you got bundled up adequately to face the chilly nights. Uh, this is a wide angle view centered on Leo, showing the location of the challenge objects. Uh, I was able to capture a couple of these uh, that I'll show you tonight. I didn't manage uh, NGC 3444, so a nice catch on that one, uh, Bob. Uh, okay, Chris, the next one, please. The first one is uh, is uh, Messier 67. Uh, it, uh, is, as Richard mentioned, it's, a, it's an open cluster in the uh, constellation Cancer. Uh, it's also, uh, as he indicated, it's, it's, it's also referred to as the golden eye cluster, but uh, another, another popular name for it is the King Cobra cluster, interestingly enough. Uh, the cluster you can see here is at the, uh, at the center of the image. Uh, it has a diameter of about 20 light years and is estimated to be about 2,800 light years from, from us here on Earth. From, from our point of view, uh, the cluster spans about 22 arc minutes across or about three quarters of the diameter of the full moon. So I, I took this shot through, uh, uh, through uh, my Canon uh, 70D and a 300 millimeter uh, uh, telephoto lens at f4.5. And it's a stack of six uh, two minute exposures at ISO 2500. Next one, please. 
So this cluster is a nice target even through a small telescope and we can zoom in here for a closer look. I, I took the next image through my 11 inch HD and it, it captures the central region of the cluster. Next one, please, Chris. So the cluster itself is believed to have formed somewhere between three to five billion years ago. Uh, that's not the oldest known open cluster, but there are no other clusters known to be older that are closer to us than M67. Uh, it's interesting though, because uh, open clusters like this, as they circulate around the galaxy in, in, their, in their long orbits tend to disperse over time. So yeah, ha having a cluster uh, with this age, three to, three to five billion years, uh, and there's some discrepancy in that, in that wide range, um, is, is rather unusual that they haven't dispersed yet. The cluster itself has uh, more than 500 uh, known or identified members uh, with at least 100 of stars similar to our own sun, uh, as well as numerous red giants. I took this shot through the 11 inch edge, edge HD and it's a stack of uh, 11 60 second exposures taken with the Canon 70D at ISO 2500. Next one, please, Chris. So, LEO uh, is, a, is a galaxy hunter's playground, as Oscar mentioned. Uh, the, the constellation contain, contains a number of relatively close galaxies, and this translates to galaxies that are large enough from our point of view to exhibit some really nice detail, especially when imaged with a bit of a larger telescope. There are a couple of interesting groupings of these relatively large galaxies within LEO, and one of them is the M95, M96, M105 group, also known as LEO1. And this, that's what we're, we're seeing here. Uh, the intermediate challenge object from last month, uh, 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 from Oscar, was M105. And so we can have a closer look at that here. Notice that there are two smaller NGC objects in closer proximity to 105, which uh, have also been talked about. Uh, next one, please. So M105 is, the, is an elliptical galaxy. It's uh, obviously the one at the top here. Uh, it's about 32 million light years away. And like most ellipticals, it has very little in the way of observable structure. Uh, the absence of a lot of free gas and dust uh, that we see in spiral galaxies means that there is not a lot of star formation going on here. However, the galaxy is believed to har harbor a supermassive black hole at, this, at its center, weighing in at about 200 million times the mass of our sun. By comparison, the uh, black hole, uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy is estimated to have a mass of about 6 million times the mass of the sun. So this one in, in M105 is, is uh, quite a bit more massive. Uh, the other two galaxies that you see here, the, the nearby galaxies, NG, uh, NGC 3384 and uh, further 3389 um, are also comparable in size to, to M105. Um, M30 or NGC 3384 is, is, what known, is what's known as a barred lenticular galaxy and 3389 is a spiral. Uh, my image here is a 48 minute uh, DSLR composite taken with the 11 inch edge HD. Okay, next one please, Chris. My last two slides are the more photogenic members of the LEO1 group. Um, this one, M96, is just a stunning spiral galaxy, and it's the brightest member of this group that we're looking at. The very pronounced dust lanes uh, and distorted spiral arms are likely the signs of gravitational interactions with its neighbors. The galaxy itself is about 100,000 light years in diameter, about the size of our own Milky Way, and it's approximately 32 million light years distant. Interestingly, from our point of view here on Earth, if you look closely at this, uh, you can see a more distant edge on the spiral galaxy right through the lower spiral arm of M96's dusty disk. That's uh, it's about five times farther away though than, than M96 itself. So it's definitely a background object, but it's kind of cool that we can see it right through the, uh, right through the, uh, the dusty outer regions of, of M96. So uh, this is a 54-minute composite uh, DSLR exposure taken with, uh, with the 11-inch Edge HD. Next one, please, Chris, and my last one, actually. Uh, M95 is, is also a very striking barred spiral. I, I particularly love this one because we see this one almost completely face-on, which allows for an unobstructed view of its core and central bar regions. Uh, the spiral arms are rich in dust and many bright areas of star formation are, are visible along those uh, inner spiral arms. Uh, this galaxy also had a recent supernova explosion back in, in 2012. The galaxy itself is about 75,000 light years in diameter and is approximately 33 million light years distant. 
this uh, this image is a, is a 108 minute uh, composite uh, DSLR exposure, also taken with the 11 inch HD. So both of these last two that I've shown you, M95 and M96, are, are observable with a, a 10 inch scope. And that, that's about the minimum required to resolve the sort of the galactic halos and the brighter core regions of, of these galaxies. Needless to say, a, a dark rural sky is also a definite asset. Anyway, clear skies to you all. That's the best, That's all I've got for you this month, and we'll catch you soon. Take care. Thank you, Paul. That completes our um, observations. So uh, back to you, Mick. And thank you to all our presenters, and uh, particularly for uh, pretty well staying online on on time as well as online. Okay, so the review of last month's challenge objects. Um, we had a bonus because we've got two Crater Janssens. Uh, next one, please, Chris. So this month, Oscar is basically offering for everybody to get rid of their mounts and drives because all three deep sky objects are within about five degrees of each other, starting with Messier 98, and Coma Berenices at 11th magnitude, 10 by 3 minutes, seconds, minutes, angular size. Next one. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away, NGC 4312. Another spiral in Coma Berenices, 12.5 apparent magnitude, 5 by 1 second, minutes. Next. Another short jump away. The advanced object is IC double three double five, a regular galaxy in Virgo, fifteenth magnitude, and one by a half minutes apparent size. Next, please. Lunar challenge. Cenus Iridium, the the Bay of Rainbows, a massive flooded crater on the edge of Mare Imbrium. 250 kilometers in diameter. And of course, it's got the uh, well-known promontories of Heraclides and Laplace sort of bounding the, the flooded area. So moving on, summary of our challenge objects. Thank you, Oscar, once again. Next, please. I'll just intervene with a comment yep. there, Mick. Uh, of course, anyone who has any uh, doubts about which objects we're referring to in these challenges. All of these observing challenge slides are reproduced uh, both in Astronauts and I have no doubt they're on our fabulously provisioned website. Absolutely. Okay, our Fred Lossing Observatory already noted that it's open for business with the only COVID requirement being masks to be worn in the clubhouse. Next. Uh, members star night at FLO is tomorrow, waxing crescent moon, hopefully, maybe some of the clouds will um, not join us for that one. Next, uh, the usual gang of suspects uh, responsible for providing services to members here in Rask, Ottawa. Next, please. Total peak audience, 83 tonight, not bad. Uh, special thanks to all the speakers and to Rask National for providing us with the uh, access to the Zoom webinars. Any comments, ideas for meetings to me, please, at meetingchair.ottawa.rask.ca. Next and last, I believe, next meeting. Friday, 6th of May, same time, 7.30 p.m. Again, it will be a webinar. Hopefully, we're soon to be on a countdown for be able to going back to at least mixed media meetings. And with that, I wish everyone a good night. Sorry we ran a little bit over time. And hope to see you in a month's time. Thank you. I'm looking forward, Mick, to the chance to take this a new photo to replace this one with you at the podium. It's Yay. Easy. <laughs> I'll wear a suit. I'll remember that. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>